it's great to be here with you all. Um, I will go through my first series of slides, the first set of slides quickly, just to give you some background. Um, just so you know, I am the executive vice president for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which is the largest um, foundation solely focused on health. And recently we've been really focusing on building a culture of health and advancing health equity. But what I'll talk about today is more related to the work that I did in my past role as a former commissioner for the health department of Chicago Department of Public Health and a place where I spent over two decades of my career. Um, what I, what I, this quote in particular I wanted to start with because I think it is really a critical opportunity for us to learn from the past to profit by the present and from the present to live better in the future. Because as we reflect upon our experiences with H1N1 influenza uh, in 2009, there are some direct lessons that we can learn in correlations with what happened then to what we can do now with COVID-19. I start with this because I, and I know that you've had a lot of discussions in prior sessions about the value of vaccines, but I do want to mention that we, part of why this is so essential is because we have a long and storied history of um, success with immunizations. In fact, they are acknowledged as one of the top 10 public health achievements in the 20th century, included with many other critical successes that we've had in the past. There's my lovely quote, which you all got to hear but didn't get to see in my graphic. You can move to the next slide. Um, and again, the long list of successes with immunizations as being the number one top 10 public health achievement. And, and this table, I think someone referenced, may have referenced this in prior sessions for you all, but the success that we've had with vaccines is, is truly remarkable. If you look at smallpox, you look at uh, polio, you look at measles, you can see the dramatic impact we've had in terms of reduction of disease. So the average annual morbidity in the 20th century, 20th century has really been dropped significantly for these diseases. So we have had major successes with vaccines and that's why there is so much great hope for this COVID vaccine. Next slide. And again, you've seen this slide before, and the only reason I bring this up is because I want to point out that those successes were not easily accomplished. The complexity of the immunization, immunization schedule is manifest by these schedules, over 17 vaccines that are recommended for during the lifetime um, to actually prevent these diseases. Next slide. So this is where I want to dig in a little bit more deeply. I think it's really important to understand that in order for us to have those 17 vaccines administered to people to actually ultimately prevent disease, it requires a very coordinated system. It's a federal, state, and local immunization system. And that strong system is really based on multiple components. It starts at the top with vaccine delivery, but it also relates to healthcare provider support, uh, vaccine accountability and management, monitoring the effectiveness of the vaccines, electronic systems to make sure that vaccines are administered appropriately, coverage levels that have been determined. Also understanding and addressing racial and ethnic disparities in immunization coverage levels, as well as disease. We've seen that play out with time and time with um, infectious disease outbreaks in terms of racial and ethnic disparities and who gets sick and also who's not getting vaccinated. And then also outbreak investigation and control by use of vaccines. So this system is a complex, federal, state, and local immunization systems that exist. Next slide. The cornerstone of this system is really the Vaccines for Children program, which actually it was created after the 1989-1990 measles epidemic, where tens of thousands of children and adults got sick and thousands actually died because of measles. And that is a vaccine preventable disease at the time. So in the early 1990s, the Vaccines for Children program was established. And that program is a really a network of, of starting at the federal, state, and going down to the local levels, where over 44,000 providers in the United States actually receive over 83 million doses of vaccine. And those vaccines are actually meant for children who are Medicaid enrolled, uninsured, underinsured, American Indian, and Native Alaskan children. So it assures that these children have access to free vaccine. And they're, they're not expected to pay for anything and they're able to achieve the high coverage levels that we need to really prevent these serious diseases. Because of who receives these vaccines, that program has played a pivotal role in terms of really addressing racial and ethnic disparities in young children. So the Vaccines for Children program is really the cornerstone of this complex immunization system. Next slide, please. The other elements that round out this um, 
the system are really supported through the Section 317 program. And so the VSC program really focuses on vaccine delivery to these high risk and underserved children, traditionally underserved children. And then the rest of the complex system is really supported by the 317 program. And the area that I'd really focus in on is the outbreak and investigation control and control aspect of the 317 program. So in times like a pandemic, when outbreaks occur, this program really ramps up and is able to then generate support for the states and locals so they can actually get these emergency vaccines to the appropriate parties. Next, next slide, please. Oh, so that just shows the rounding out of the, um, the system. Next slide, please. So what I want to talk about now really is the experience that we had in Chicago through the H1N1 pandemic. Is this is something that's really stuck into my mind because of the time and effort that it took to really coordinate this effort. But for some of you, this might be new. So I'll go through some basic information about the outbreak itself. Next slide. So just as a reminder, or maybe just to introduce you to the concept, in 2009 and 2010, there was an H1N1 influenza pandemic. It was a of H1N1 flu virus that jumped from swine to humans. And in Chicago, we saw it play out by having early detection of disease in the in end of April, beginning of May, in the first wave of disease, which peaked in June. And then it subsided in the summer months and then resurged actually in the fall. So we actually peaked in activity uh, in, in, at the end of October, beginning of November. And what was interesting about this is because it was a flu, vac flu disease, there were systems in place to develop flu vaccines already, and so it was easier to ramp up development of vaccine. And so almost immediately when we detected this novel strain of influenza, there were plans being made to actually ramp up this system, just assist our, our baseline system to distribute and allocate vaccine once it became available. Next slide. So the interesting thing about that outbreak is that when we think about that as it compares to COVID-19, who was affected was actually fairly different. While we're seeing older folks, people with underlying health conditions getting sick with COVID-19, with the H1N1, what we saw was that younger people were more likely to get sick with the disease and more likely to be hospitalized. And yet the magnitude and the severity of the disease was much less severe. And so fewer people got hospitalized, fewer people died. And so, but what we did notice that was similar though between H1N1 and actually what is happening right now is that those, even though the proportion of patients that were actually hospitalized was smaller, the hospitalization rates by race and ethnicity were fairly similar to what we're seeing right now with COVID-19. And you'll see that again in a slide that I show later on. But this is for H1N1 hospitalization rates by race and ethnicity in 2009 and 2010. And you can see that Black, Hispanic, and American Indian, Alaska Native um, people were much more likely to be hospitalized than white, uh, not white non-Hispanics. And so you can see that that disproportionate impact that we're seeing play out now with COVID-19 is also fairly similar. It was fairly similar to what we saw with H1N1 as well. Next slide. So because of, as I described, there was this, we had this first wave of lower levels of disease. And because we already had flu vaccines and systems in place to develop that vaccine, there was rapid production of vaccine um, over the course of um, when the uh, H1N1 was first detected and when we were actually ready to start vaccinating. So in order to ramp up a system though, to actually distribute the vaccine, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention really played a critical role. And this federal coordination is really an essential component of a successful vaccine program. And I say that because when I, if you think back to the systems that I described to you earlier, where there was actually, a, there is a clear system for distribution of, and allocation of vaccine throughout the nation to all states, to territories, and to many, and to all urban areas as well. This system actually was the system that this, um, uh, the federal coordination was really built upon, but it really required at the highest level at CDC for there to be this coordination so that we were all, all states and locals were working in lockstep. So CDC was the center of this work, working with international organizations, states and local health agencies, vaccine manufacturers to make sure the vaccines were all coming in together and then going out to in their appropriate distribution. Insurance companies were actually engaged to make sure the vaccine was covered when it was administered to patients. Vaccine suppliers and manufacturers actually were coordinating things as well in terms of um, the supplies like uh, syringes, alcohol swabs, band-aids, 
uh, uh, sharps containers, all those things were brought in and coordinated so they were distributed in an equitable fashion. And the federal agency coordination was essential as well. So CDC was really played a critical role in this coordination of the vaccine distribution. Next slide. But this is where I sat in 2009 and 2010 was at the Chicago Department of Public Health. And so we were the recipient of a lot of great guidance and federal coordination from CDC. But it was our job really to work within our local jurisdiction to make sure that we could get the vaccine out to the appropriate people in a timely fashion. And so we really engaged with other state and county agencies within Illinois, workplaces, community and faith organizations, because it was really important to get critical messages out, schools, colleges, universities, healthcare providers and local elected officials. So we played that central coordination role within the state, within the city of Chicago and worked very closely with the state of Illinois as well. Next slide, please. So the, the way that Chicago approached vaccine distribution was we recognized that there was a, there was a system in place based on the VFC program that I mentioned earlier and also adult provider network that could actually get the vaccine out to people who had healthcare providers. And so we tapped into that system. We identified, enrolled, enrolled and distributed vaccine to healthcare providers spanning the spectrum of age. Uh, where our VFC program is really focused on children, this then broadened to adult providers as well. And then recognizing that not all Chicagoans actually had access to healthcare providers, and also that some healthcare providers might not want to administer the vaccine or not feel they had the capacity to do so. We also conducted mass immunization cl clinics for those patients who, and residents who didn't really have healthcare providers or whose healthcare providers really did not choose to order the vaccine. Again, this is uh, a little bit busy slide, but I think it's important to point out. This, it describes the cumulative vaccine doses that were allocated to us in the blue line, those that were distributed by us uh, in the red line, and then also uh, the green line, which is those doses that were actually administered. So what you can see is from the beginning of October through the beginning of January, so about 13 weeks period of time, the city received an allocation of about 1.1 million doses of vaccine. Sorry, one point, it was just one, the allocation was one point, over 1.2 million doses. And we were actually able to distribute more than 1.1 million doses of vaccine throughout the city within 13 week period of time. The, ye the yellow green line actually suggests how much was administered. We know that a lot more of the, of the vaccine was actually administered, but there's just poor reporting. But from our perspective, it was a fairly efficient mechanism for getting the vaccine out quickly to healthcare providers and into the arms of our residents. So this is a slide of a map of the city of Chicago, and it just each dot represents a site where the vaccine was administered. And you can see that they were scattered throughout the city of Chicago. So we actually were able to get more than 700, almost 800 sites that were um, received vaccine and were actually administering vaccines. And uh, we were able to reach into various pockets of the, the community, which was really important. Our mass vaccination clinics, which were meant for people who didn't necessarily have healthcare providers or whose providers didn't have the vaccine, it was interesting. We scattered them through the city of Chicago, mostly in communities that are underserved traditionally. And what we found was very interesting. The, those sites that we had on the north side of the city of Chicago really had long lines winding throughout the, the clinics. And the clinics on our south and our west sides of Chicago, which are predominantly African-American and Latino, actually had much poorer turnout. And so we could see that we really weren't reaching out and getting into those communities to get them to come out to the vaccine. And we didn't, we, we weren't able to do it on our own. So we reached out to many community organizations, faith organizations to get into those communities to try to help us to, to improve um, demand from that, those populations and actually get the vaccine into those who really need it. We were moderately successful in terms of getting them to help us drive demand, but it was not something that I feel like we were really successful with overall, but we did have the data to tell us that we needed to move forward in that way. So again, I just bring this up to remind us that we can take lessons learned from H1N1 to apply to the COVID-19. And so um, what I wanna do is just pull up some slides related to COVID-19 and make some, give you some recommendations for how I think things should proceed from a COVID perspective. Again, this is just a reminder of what we're experiencing with COVID hospitalizations by age group and that it is was different than H1N1 and the, the severity of disease is much more dramatic than it was in H1N1. And yet the approach from a vaccination perspective should be fairly similar, getting the vaccine out as quickly as possible to those who have the greatest or highest risk initially when supply is low and then broadening as time goes on. Next slide. And then this slide really just summarizes the hospitalization rates by race and ethnicity for COVID. And as you can see, again, it's 
um, non-Hispanic American Indians, Hispanics, African Americans, much higher rates of hospitalization than non-Hispanic whites and Asians. And so you can see the risk again is higher. This disease is disproportionately impacting those of people of color. Next slide. So, so my recommendations for a successful COVID-19 vaccine distribution based on lessons learned from H1N1 really relate to going back to the need for coordination at the federal, state, and local levels. We have a strong infrastructure and system in place uh, for immunizations, and that really needs to be tapped into because we were able to ramp up distribution of vaccine fairly quickly uh, during H1N1, and building on that system will actually allow us to be equally successful. What I would say is that we have learned some lessons too in terms of the need to really acknowledge and address the disproportionate impact on communities of color. We saw it time and time again with public health emergencies, whether it's heat waves, whether it's measles epidemics, whether it's H1N1, or whether it's COVID-19, we see this disproportionate impact on communities of color and low-income communities. And it really behooves us to take this seriously and to work with the communities themselves. Um, to really engage with them and understand what it is that are the barriers to the getting, um, this, what, why are they getting sick? Also, in terms of vaccine acceptance, what are their concerns about the vaccine? What do they need to know? How do we help them to make sure that they get the vaccine so we don't just exacerbate this, uh, the disproportionate impact that we're seeing with people in terms of getting disease? Next slide, please. What I wanted to conclude with the last two slides are really related to a focus on health equity, which really relates to getting the vaccine to, to everyone. So health equity really means that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. And this requires removing obstacles to health such as poverty, discrimination, and their consequences, including powerlessness and lack of access to good jobs with fair pay, quality education, housing, safe environments, and health care. And I read that to you because I think that's it's the concept of health equity is not clear to all. But to me, what it really means is that we really need to make sure that those who need the vaccines, who need the services the most, really get them. And in order to do that, we really do need to engage with the community to understand what their needs are and how best to address how best, what the best solutions are so we can make sure that they are best protected. What I conclude with is really a health equity principles that, that Robert Wood Johnson Foundation released it at the end of May. While we've been talking about health equity a lot since this outbreak occurred because people are seeing how people of color are really being impacted by this disease, people don't really know how to operationalize it. What does it mean to address health equity? And so we gave five different principles for state and local leaders to really use to respond to respond to the outbreak, reopen and recover. And they focus on things like disaggregation of data because in order for us to respond appropriately, we really need to disaggregate the data and know who's affected. But the second key principle is really this concept of engagement with community and working with community so we understand what the problems are, what the challenges are, and what are the solutions that will help us to assure that they are able to be protected and they are less likely to become sick and seriously ill. Thank you so much, Doctor. Um, my name is Hannah. I'm with Crosscut in Washington State. Uh, you mentioned that there were certain healthcare providers that did not order a vaccine uh, during H1N1, and I'm wondering if there were reasons uh, connecting all of them, the reasons that they didn't order the vaccine, and what we might learn from that now. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the, the groups of providers that we engage that we're not, or who we don't usually work with, which are adult healthcare providers, adult internal medicine physicians, ob gynees wide variety of geri geriatricians, you know, many of them did, but there were some providers who felt like they didn't have the capacity. It means you have to have the appropriate refrigeration units, you have to have the appropriate supplies, you have to have staff who are willing to vaccinate. And so it was really more a matter of whether or not they really had felt that they had the capacity to do it. I don't, I, we didn't get a strong sense of people were non-believers in the vaccine or hesitant about the vaccine. We did a lot of work with the healthcare providers to educate them about the value and the need for the vaccine. I didn't get the sense of, of, that it was that as much. It was just they didn't feel like they had the capacity to actually deliver the vaccine efficiently or effectively. Thank you. All right, great. So now we'll turn it over to Dr. George's Benjamin. Um, Dr. Benjamin, thank you very much. Uh, he's been a great speaker for us in the past, as has Dr. Marita and, and Dr. Gupta. Um, we'll turn it over to Dr. Benjamin right now. Let me just say that uh, Dr. Marita talked a bit about the importance of, a, of an infrastructure. And I just want to point out that that infrastructure occurs before uh, the outbreak. You have to make sure you have a system in place that's adequate. Um, the, the goal, obviously, of any basic infrastructure is to get control of the pandemic, to vaccinate those people you view as at risk, to ensure accountability 
for public dollars because there's a lot of public money in here. Um, data collection is very, very important and having the, the mechanism to communicate effectively to the public about vaccines is extremely important. Um, you know, um, up right now, the nation needs to be concerned about not just um, the, the vaccine being made, but how do you get it? Who's going to buy it? How do you procure it? Transport and delivery around the country, storage, refrigeration. Turns out that, as I understand it, some of the vaccine candidates that we're looking at now for, for COVID-19 require deep refrigeration, you know, um, 80 degrees below centigrade, those kinds of crazy um, deep refrigerations. Obviously, you don't have that in your house and your doctor doesn't have that in their office. So those are some of the things we have to have to think about. Distribution. Uh, initially, I anticipate the governor, will the government will push the vaccine out since they're talking about buying the first 100 million doses. Um, that means they'll decide where that vaccine goes initially. Um, it also means that your doctor um, and the usual system may not get it um, early in the, in the distribution cycle before we get general distribution of the vaccine. Supply line management has been a big issue. You know, it's been a challenge for us around testing, um, around personal protective equipment. Um, the same thing is going to happen with this because clearly this vaccine will require some special conditions. We don't know what they are right now, but making sure there's adequate access to syringes, vial stoppers, even alcohol swabs um, and, and gloves are gonna be a challenge. Remember that we're gonna be vaccinating everyone in the world. So that means just like testing, there's gonna be supply chain issues that we've gotta work through um, early in the process. Um, and then of course, building trust. I know you've already had some discussions around vaccine hesitancy. Um, I've argued that we need a really an, a, a massive national public health campaign that uses stress as messengers. Um, when we did HIV AIDS, when I was a health officer in Washington, DC, we had, we educated barbers, beautician, faith leaders, Mrs. Jones in the corner, um, who was a community activist. So that we had, anywhere you went, um, you got, you got a, hopefully an, a, a well-informed message. Um, I, I love to think as a physician, people like to do what I, what I recommend that they do. But the truth of the matter is they get a lot of trusted messengers from a range of other people. Um, the anti-vaccine communities already started giving disinformation um, in a variety of places. Um, so we gotta, we gotta combat that, particularly now um, in the social media world. When I was uh, uh, a local health officer in Washington, DC, we did not have social media. Uh, when I was a state health official in Maryland, we were just now getting the internet to be more involved. But right now, as you know, it's explosive. A lot of people get both their facts and misinformation from that, and we've got to address it as we go forward. Um, um, some of you may know this is an animated uh, um, molecule um, that I just thought was cool, so I put it here, because why not? Uh, so we have a vaccine. Finally, we ultimately get a vaccine that we all believe is safe. We'll come back, we can talk about that in the Q&A. Effective, because you know, a range of effectiveness from making sure you're totally disease-free to making sure you don't get really sick and die and a whole range of, of options for what the vaccine might do um, that. And then, the, you know, who's it, who's it effective for? Whether, you know, right now we're testing it for adults. We're not yet making a vaccine for kids. So that, that's another discussion we ought to have. And then making it affordable. It's not just the cost of the vaccine itself, but it's also the cost of actually administering the vaccine. And I understand the administration is looking at both of those and looking at ways to make that relatively cost-free for everybody. Um, and then, of course, our next steps, once we have a vaccine, are deciding who gets it, um, deciding how we distribute it, continue to produce it, because this is going to be a new production model. The good news is no chickens, no eggs, like flu vaccine. Um, but how do you produce this and how do you do this quickly? Getting people to accept it, um, not just getting one shot in the arm, but we may have to get two shots in the arm to be, to be most effective. So what's the spacing of that and how do you, get, how do you make that happen? Making sure that uh, appropriate reporting into the vaccine, the VIRA system, as you know, which is the reporting system for safety um, and dealing with side effects, everything from fevers to sore arms um, to, um, to real challenges. Um, priority setting um, remains and equity remains a big issue here. Um, clearly we ought to make sure we're dealing with the uninfected who are at highest risk. If you're infected, theoretically, you don't have to have the vaccine, but we don't know that right now. Um, 
healthcare providers, um, people with chronic diseases. Um, we need to ensure equity and vaccine seeking behavior. Uh, again, there's a lot of targeted messages out there to communities of color not to get the vaccine, reminding them people of Tuskegee. Um, I would like to argue the best way to get people that, you know, in, in the vaccine program is to get people in the vaccine research programs. So we got to address this misinformation quickly and dissuade people about cost issues because obviously people are going to be very concerned uh, about the cost of vaccine, particularly the cost of vaccine administration, because it costs you money to go to the doctor, even if at the end of that visit you get the vaccine. Quite commonly, there are things that, you, that, that, that happen um, along that line. In fact, just yesterday, I got a note from our um, um, insurance company that, that insures my employees at APHA, letting us know that they're no longer honoring the, the co-payment um, moratorium on vaccine. So that they're, they're back to um, 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 charging you if you have something else that you have to get cared for, you have to pay for that as part of that co-payment. Um, we know that there are going to be some issues around black marketing of the vaccine. Uh, there are going to be vaccine shortages because there always are. Production difficulties. Um, after pr production, the product somehow gets spoiled. It goes somewhere. It gets too hot. The product is spoiled. So you lose, you know, a couple million doses. Um, and supply line disruptions, uh, as we talked about earlier. Um, Julie did a great job talking about all the components of the um, of, of the system. This is a much more detailed look um, from the CDC perspective, thinking that, that at least initially the federal government is going to be involved in this. So you've got barter, which is involved in putting money out for vaccine distribution. CDC is going to be intimately involved with um, thinking about how we distribute this. Uh, um, I would argue that we're going to try to put this through our existing vaccine systems to some degree. So we'll go to state local health departments very early on. Retail clinics will be involved because they've got an enormous reach. Um, whether or not it gets right to the pharmacies and the doctor's offices early on remains to be seen. But again, as I mentioned, when there's a shortage of the vaccine, they want to make sure it gets to the right people. And by the way, we ought to also remind ourselves that there's a national security aspect to this too. Because for many reasons, there may be a group of, of our troops that will need to be be vaccinated as part of this process. So there's a lot of people that are going to have their hands in the priority set, not just the ACIP, CDC, um, um, but I'm sure the National Security Council will have a role in that as well. Um, and then, of course, the whole issue of, of accepting this vaccine once we get it um, is going to be a big issue. You know, you have to ask yourself even now, right now, if the vaccine was ready today, do I want to be in line first to get it? You know, that's the question we're all going to be asking. Um, and then tracking and monitoring the vaccination, making sure that we have really good systems to know who got vaccinated, who didn't. Um, and um, this data system is going to be very, very important. And it's going to be important to get um, race, ethnicity, gender, um, probably occupation, um, all the logistical parts of where they got vaccinated. Um, and right now, you know, we cannot even do the basic data collection for the disease process. Um, so we've got to make sure this system's in place before this vaccine is done. And then finally, what can go wrong? I, always, I like this picture because this is a, a, pres a picture of President Ford getting his shot during the great um, swine flu um, outbreak. Um, I've always, I kind of encourage elected officials not to do this publicly, although it's designed to give public confidence. This was done the, one at the time we had a, a, a mass campaign that went wrong. So you ask yourself what can go wrong. This is a 76 swine flu outbreak where we had some deaths, several people got sick. They created, we had the, a big massive national campaign. Um, several cases of, of Guillain-Barre syndrome um, because a, a lot or two of the vaccine got contaminated um, and people actually got sick from the vaccinations. It ultimately resulted in termination of the mass campaign. And some would argue that this is one of the reasons that the president lost the election. Um, I don't know if that's true, but, but, that, but this campaign was, was a real mess. About 25% of the population did get vaccinated that year. The important thing is that the great pandemic did come. So big massive campaign, lots of hoopla, 
outbreak didn't occur. So it's not relevant to today because we are in a big outbreak. But the point is, we have to think about what we do in these, these mass campaigns um, and be prepared for this. They were not prepared previously for to, to manage the, the risk communication on this. Um, we know that most side effects of vaccines are mild if they're properly tested. Um, but we have to differentiate real adverse events uh, and their causes. Um, we need to have good situational awareness of what's happening. And we need to make sure that we have a sound risk communication plan. Um, because all you have to do is have two or three people um, get sick in proximity to the time that they got their vaccination. Um, and then in this environment, we'll be off to the races trying to figure out whether or not it's related or not. With that, I'll stop. These are just some websites that you can go to. Um, obviously, like APHA and CDC and WHO, I still vigorously trust the CDC and WHO websites. There's an amazing amount of information there as you're doing stories. Hi, Dr. Benjamin. Um, I'm Natalie. I'm with the Gray Television Washington DC Bureau. Um, and I wanted to know, uh, based on that presentation to what you thought that the president's role will be in encouraging the public uh, once we get the vaccine and with that in mind that it could be President Trump or President or future President Biden. Yeah, well, well, I, I would hope that the president that is in office at the time um, provides a leadership role and that leadership role is to encourage people to get the vaccination and tell them that um, the vaccine is here, here's why we think people need to get vaccinated, and then leave the science and the details to, to, the, to the experts. But I do believe that leaders should lay the groundwork, offer their prestige and bully pulpit to promote the idea, um, and then leave the, the details to the experts. Because by the way, at, at some point, there will, something will go wrong, it always does. And you'll need your experts to be able to explain to the public um, how we navigate that and what it means. Thank you. Um, Andrew? Hi, Andrew Dunn from Business Insider. I was wondering on the distribution plan, you mentioned traditionally you use state health departments um, to, to kind of get a vaccine out. I'm wondering what we know today about Operation Warp Speed. They seem to be working with more of the DOD side for, for the logistics and distribution. Um, what do you know about that plan to date? And do you see that as a good thing? Is it a good idea to use the DOD for this? Uh, or are there concerns you have in mind about, you know, how this will all work out? Well, the DOD, the DOD is, is pretty good at doing logistics and moving things from point A to point B. Um, and the issue isn't whether or not they move things from point A to point B, but, but how they do that. So what, one of the things we need to be cautious of, as you know, during World War um, II, um, we had to build a whole new blood distribution system because the military did not have any idea how to move medical materials, um, particularly blood. So they had to build a blood distribution system that the military managed, but they had to learn how to do it. So if the military medical corps is involved and intimately involved in this, um, then, I, then I see good progress in that. If they try to have a bunch of people that move tanks do this, um, their logistical knowledge is important. But like I said, you're going to have to, my understanding is that this vaccine, at least today, requires um, pretty deep refrigeration. And so that's going to require some real technical expertise. And the ability to test the vaccine, you know, before it goes in and then test it to make sure it's potent when it comes out. So they're going to have to really build a, a system. But, um, and, and hopefully it's an all of government effort where all of government is involved in this and they and figure out how to do this right. Does that help you? Yeah. Is the level of transparency you've seen so far it's still early in the process, but has it been sufficient? Have you been pleased with it as far as what we know about OWS? Or is it, is it yeah. early days where you should give them some slack? You know, the level of transparency for this administration has been terrible overall. Um, I do think it's still early on. Um, and um, um, let, me, let me just say that, because I, I have been, you know, I've been asked privately, um, from my opinion. So I do, I do know they're reaching out to people to try to figure this out. Um, but I, I'm a, I'm a, you know, I'm an ER doc and I've done a lot of, been in a lot of emergencies and I believe you build on the system that you have and that people know versus creating something entirely new. And I don't know if Julie agrees with that or not, but, but I believe you do that. 
Um, so to the extent they do that, I think they'll be successful. Um, obviously, what we're hoping on is that um, both, you know, both the, the current administration and um, you know any new any new administration after you know that's that's looking to run. So Biden's folks are are thinking about this because whoever has this probably in January or February, because that's when it's really going to hit, um, can hit the ground running. Thank you. Okay, we'll, we'll take two two more questions as long as they're kind of quick, so we can move on to Dr. Gupta. But we have Lisa and then Kira. Um, you can have a quick question, and then we'll move on. Um, yeah, thank you. Lisa Krieger with the San Jose Mercury News. When we look at, this gets to the issue of prioritization and uh, uh, distribution, um, assuming supplies will be limited, at least initially. Folks who are dying are the elderly and those with chronic medical conditions. Folks who are transmitting it seem to be younger and in social gatherings and all of that. But mm. I'm thinking if we're trying to curtail a, an infectious disease, who do we go to? But, who gets yeah, to be first? I, I, well, well, so first of all, the, que the first question is, how, you know, how much vaccine do you have to do? Uh -huh. how, you know, so let, let's say, for example, we're, we, you know, we've got 25 million doses initially. Um, most likely they're going to do to try to protect those people who are at highest risk. Um, and what I mean by that um, is probably healthcare workers. <laughs> um, I, I would argue that probably the healthcare workers um, are at probably at the highest risk. And that will include people in nursing homes, the staff in nursing homes. Uh, it may also include some of the non-medical staff in nursing homes. Um, and, and so I don't have a good answer for you, but I would, I would think that that would be the first, at least if I had to do, and I was king of the world today, that's probably where I would start if I had 25 million doses. Um, it seems like... There are two different missions. You know, one is to protect people from dying, and certainly people on the front lines, the healthcare workers. Yeah. If we actually want to interrupt transmission, it seems like a different population. And well, it, it is, and and there may be some models. There may be some modeling that we can do to give us to give us a an idea of, um, of how best to do that. Um, and I, and I think that you, can, you can put together a mathematical model to do that. Chris, is it okay if I jump in? Yeah, real quick. Yeah. Yeah. So I think if we look back at it, with H1N1 as our most recent experience with prioritization of vaccine, what they did is they looked at who was highest risk to get sick and also considered who are first responders, who are essential services, because we do need to maintain certain operations. And so I think that will be the same approach that's taken right now. There are groups that are working on this right now that include academicians, ethicists, many, a broad range of folks who are looking at the data to see who is most effective, most likely to be seriously ill, who are critical infrastructure. But they're also looking at the, they'll look at the vaccine efficacy. How good, how well does this vaccine work with elderly? How well does it work with young people? Because that is another factor to consider. So like George has mentioned, there's a whole array of considerations that need to be taken into, into and be considered as these priority, priority groups are, are developed. But the other key thing is when these priority groups are developed really vetting them and sharing them publicly so that people have a chance to weigh in. What they did in H1N1 was they took the priority groups out and vetted them with focus groups within community to make sure the community was comfortable and, and that they had an opportunity to weigh in into it as well. So that will be, a, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that that will be the way that they approach it this time as well. Thank you. Okay, and Kira, one uh, last question, then we'll move on to Dr. Gupta. Hi, Kira from LeapsMag. Thank you for the presentation uh, to both speakers. I'm wondering if you're aware of any innovations or new technology and development right now that could help address some of the uh, supply chain issues and logistical rollout challenges? Yeah, I'm, I'm not aware of, uh, of, of any, intervention, any interventions, uh, innovations that are going on. Um, I don't know if any of my other two colleagues are. Yeah, what, you know, I, I know since we learned a lot through H1N1, and so the vaccine distribution system itself, the, they, the CDC modernized the vaccine distribution electronic system that was used, and so it's much, much better. And so it's linked actually to a lot of the immunization registries that are working in states and local jurisdictions. So not only is the vaccine distribution in that system, but also who's getting the vaccine, which providers are getting it, and then there's actually dose-level accountability, so how many kids are actually getting the vaccine. So systems have really been improved since H1N1. There are definitely improvements and revisions that need to be made to the system. 
systems now. That's why there's some urgency in terms of getting funds to the states and locals to actually improve the systems that they have in place as well as CDC so they can ramp up the systems because there's great systems that are in place, but they've not been made for COVID-19 vaccine. They need to be being more robust now. And now is the time to act before we actually have the vaccine. So I think that there has been improvements. There are more that need to be made and the resources need to be given to the appropriate folks so they can make the changes. And, and, and you, know, this, you, know, you saw the switch from CDC to HHS for some health data. Um, what I hope they don't do is, is screw this up and do that kind of change and try to build a new system because as Julie pointed out, uh, you know, the, the, the existing system with more money and more emphasis can even do, can do this quite well. Okay. So uh, good questions there. We'll have plenty of time for additional questions after Dr. Gupta. So we have Dr. Rahul Gupta, um, who, who as I said before is with the March of Dimes right now, but he also has experience on the state level as West Virginia's health commissioner before he went to the March of Dimes. So if you have questions on state level health administration, you can uh, ask him those questions. Thank you, Chris, and thanks uh, uh, to the foundation as well as my colleagues, and thank you for listening. Uh, just for, as a background, just to add that, that, yes, I have served as a state health commissioner as well as a local health commissioner, and what's interesting has been that uh, it's been coming full circle because in 1994, I launched the first Pulse Polio campaign in Delhi which eventually led to the elimination of polio 20 years later in the country of 1.3 billion people. So it's been an interesting ride. Um, you know, I, I wanna go back to this concept today is, is about past this prologue. Mark Twain famously said, the history doesn't repeat itself, but often rhymes. So I wanna take us uh, a little bit of things that we can learn from this. We went through some of this a while back. So we may not remember all that because we weren't there around. Um, also talk about the current progress in the US and around the globe and then anticipated some of the challenges and a lot of, a lot of good questions that were asked, um, but, but also how does that apply to the global because it is gonna have a ma mass impact, it's a pandemic. So it's not really March 9th story, but it's a national story and a global story. It goes all the way back when um, Basil O'Connor was a colleague of uh, FDR and, and asked, FDR asked him to start the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis. In fact, in, um, when this started to happen and we had a potential vaccine that was being funded through March of Dimes, the question became, how do we conduct those clinical trials? And actually we hired Dr. Francis out of University of Michigan to design a study. It's the first largest trial at that time in US history of 1.8 million children, because that's where the high risk population was. And then Dr. Francis thought about, what, how do we model this? So we started to do something called double blind placebo control process. So if you think about any drug trial, any vaccine trial that today goes through uh, approvals, it goes through this process that was literally form formulated at the time. So we do have some opportunities for innovation if we were to think that way through COVID as well. So think about a hundred years ago, a viral infection is transmitted person to person around the world Community spread driven by asymptomatic carriers, social distancing and appropriate hand washing to consider vital, or to help nurses are on the street patrol quarantining children um, if, if they're not, um, uh, if they're sick. It's the most dangerous for certain high risk population and serious cases require, you know, special breathing apparatus. Think about ventilator stay. Fatal, um, we do not know the current long-term disabilities of COVID, potentially if there are any, but we did then about polio. And then there's a race to develop a vaccine. So the vaccine on this side might as well, if you see the similarities, they're quite chilling in nature. This is where the developers are today. And it's very, very important to understand this piece. The reason it is, is um, as we are taking a nationalistic approach to vaccine development, that is, has happened through our policy and administrative actions, so are other countries. And the populations who want to get vaccinated will look at that. It will be, one of the challenges will be not only trying to get a particular type of vaccine into the arms of people or mouths, that matter, but also um, how do you do cold chain and everything else that, um, you know, Dr. Benjamin has talked about, Dr. Moretta has talked about, but also people are gonna wonder uh, if they're being given a foreign country manufactured vaccine. Is that really the vaccine I should take versus having a domestic? It is the times we live in, uh, but there are right now uh, 76 uh, potential candidates in the United States, about 193 total across the globe. 
These are just some of the, uh, some of the big, large companies that are being funded for most of the time. Remember, they're not funding themselves for most part. They're being funded. So here are um, various vaccine in the pipeline. And I'm, I'm sure that as you have discussed and seen some of these, these things over the week, you've seen that there are currently about six candidates in phase three trials, but majority of those are still in preclinical. Reason this is important is, as you probably heard, that some of the new technology, the new platforms like DNA, RNA, um, some of these are unique, first time happening in human populations. They have not happened. We've borrowed a page from cancer therapy and it, it, you know, the traditional platform is one thing. These other platforms are going to be a lot of experimentation and trial. It is important to understand and recognize that um, because it will have consequences. But amongst those six candidates right now includes something called BCG, something we, we give in other parts of the world for tuberculosis. But we also have obviously the mRNA that you may have heard about, as well as um, a, a, a inactivated coronavirus vaccines, which is more being developed on a traditional platform. So we had questions about the Operation War Speed. Yes, I mean, there's not a whole lot there, except to say that uh, it aims to deliver. It's a, it's a national project that aims to de deliver uh, manufactured vaccine, whichever way that is developed um, into the arms of Americans. But I'm, we need to understand, here's the funding breakdown across the world. So we, United States is funding only about a third of the total funding across the globe. Um, it's also important to know that, you know, there's 10 governments that have committed about $6 billion. Um, recently, um, you know, uh, various countries from 200,000 to multiple, you know, millions have come together in a, uh, in a situation where the United States did not participate in um, um, to uh, pledge uh, money towards development of those vaccines. Um, EU has a coronavirus global response uh, force, which is very similar to Operation Warp Speed that is ongoing now. So it's in some ways, it's, uh, we're collaborating, but in some ways, there's the rest of the world and there's us that are all racing to develop this vaccine. And it's uh, important to recognize that. As we do, uh, there are going to be some social and societal threats. So it's important to know that false information spread as opposed to even 10 years ago uh, during the H1N1. It is a lot more difficult today um, to even have a normal expected side effect. Um, and and that's, that's a challenge. We also know from experience in, from polio and other diseases that local conflicts, as well as religious and ultra, other cultural beliefs have a various impacts on the ability for populations to be vaccinated, as well as politics. Uh, we have seen uh, diseases research, including measles. And I'll share some more data in a second about polio. We also know that there has been a lot of anti-vaccine efforts that have been going on for a long time. Uh, and, and these are also, so we may, as my colleagues have mentioned, a lot of the work for building trust, supply systems, begins not when a vaccine is ready, but before that, that time is now. And we're clearly not there. However, a lot of the anti-vaccine movement is moving forward, unfortunately. So I'm gonna share with you this data. Um, for, so if you look at the top right-hand graph, and you, it, it shows you months on polio. These are two countries, pretty much, that explain the cases of wild-type polio. That's Afghanistan and Pakistan. And you can see from March onwards, especially for Afghanistan, you can see the amount of cases that have been come, being detected, wild-type polio-wise. That's the under 2020, all the way at the end. So we certainly fear a resurgence of diseases across the globe, including polio. Um, and, and in some cases, and in many cases, that this will be uh, because of both conflict as well as uncertainty and the challenges that we're facing. So as, as we move forward, there will be, as I mentioned, societal threats, but there are also unintended consequences. One of those is we expect a, the most developed economies to, um, to go down by at least 7%. That will be a challenge. On top of that, we know that millions of job losses that are happening. We also know that people are losing health insurance as a consequence. And others, as Dr. Benjamin mentioned, are tamping down. It's important to keep our eye on that. We also know that people are facing housing hardships right now. A number of folks 
um, are, are slated to not be able to pay their rent. And that's been an issue. These are all consequences that we cannot ignore as part of the uh, ability to affect. And then disease outbreaks. There's no doubt that we have data now that demonstrates that not only our families have been on the path to have fewer and fewer vaccinations with children, but during this crisis, social distancing, virtual care, the, the amount of vaccinations have been um, plummeting. And so there's no doubt that there will be a resurgence of other diseases. That's important because if you think about the platforms, if we use the traditional platforms, um, this will potentially replace the manufacture of other in, uh, immunizations, other vaccinations, uh, vaccines that we need. So it's the same platform. If you create new platforms, it'll be difficult to get enough of supply along with safety issues. So it's a challenge. It, there's no good answer about this, but it does have the potential to impact the existing amount of vaccine supply should we be able to get enough vaccines that we need to get into people, not just for COVID, for others as well. So we need to learn from the past in terms of safety distribution costs and ultimately the political will, both from domestic and international aspects. So safety, of course, I mentioned a little bit, but um, parents may not adhere to the vaccine schedule because of fear of exposure. There may be false information we discussed. Um, from an international st uh, standpoint, shelf stability, as has been mentioned before, becomes a huge issue internationally. Because we're talking about a lot of poorer countries, a global population where you literally have to carry, like we did with the oral polio vaccine, we do now, a cold chain maintained. And if there are hyper cold chain requirements, other than DNA vaccine, other vaccines are pretty much going to require that. It will be very difficult to be able to address, uh, in, especially in poor nations. And the storage is another problem. Um, mistrust remains both uh, within the United States as well as globally, as I mentioned. And then political, regional, and cultural variations. It's important to understand and recognize those. And that's where I think it's important for us to work as a ten, a, a, in partnership with the global community. Uh, distributing challenges, of course, are not only providers to rural areas within the United States uh, who cannot travel long distances, but also shortages in high risk population and high population centers, as well as I'll share some racial and ethnic disparities data as well. Um, there could be national hoarding of vaccine supply. We are certainly uh, paying a certain um, pharmaceutical companies to create and, and develop vaccine for the United States. Um, and so there could be social distancing could also create challenges because a lot of the vaccine success in other countries has been by taking the vaccine door to door, rather than expecting people often pass through their lifetime without going to a doctor in other countries. Uh, and then obviously, as I mentioned, political stability and conflict uh, will impact the supply chain as well, as we've seen in Afghanistan and Pakistan areas. Um, price gouging is a problem, an issue, but I want, I want us to understand, this will be happening at a time we also have traditional influenza epidemic each year. So it's important for us to not to overemphasize this and not underemphasize influenza. So it's going to be very important that people are able to afford both the flu vaccine and the COVID vaccine. And that's, that's an important piece because what we don't want is to, death does not care whether you die from flu or you die from complicating COVID. So it's important to note that in terms of insurance coverage as well as uh, outbreaks of influenza. So in successful um, and challenges that we anticipate challenging in launching a successful worldwide vaccination campaign, uh, we need to not go too far than, you know, literally a few years ago in, at the Qatar incident. I don't know if you've seen or read about it, but when polio vaccine was launched in Qatar um, a, a laboratory in Berkeley, California, had this huge issue with, they did everything right, yet there were 250 cases of polio and their case of paralysis. And what we found out was the protein coagulation was happening too much. So they were immediately able to do some really important, put another filter in the process and improve regulation. So here's an example where we took a step back uh, because of the safety concern and actually we improved the vaccine. Do we think we can do that today? And that's what we need to be planning for. As my colleagues have said, it's not a question of if complication will happen. Complication will happen. Adverse events will happen. The question is, we need to have a system and a structure in place with the trust in experts. And that's where the trust comes in. So they can actually address in real time the challenges that's come forward in a vaccination campaign. So this is, shows you the most current in Science Magazine where, where Americans are today. So overall, about 50% of Americans only want, will take a vaccine as today. What's important is only a quarter of black Americans are going willing to accept the vaccine and about a third of Hispanic Americans. Why is that so important? It's important because 
um, because as Dr. Morita shared, of the people who are dying as a consequence of COVID. If that's the same population that is the most hesitant because the trust in government and others isn't there, and there are other number of other factors as well, that's going to be a very uh, important factor because that will not do anything but to increase the uh, equity gap. So here are the um, total number of, uh, this is about deaths, um, you know, we share the data on hospitalization. So if you can see clearly, African Americans are dying at two and a half times the rate of white population. And it's important, it's important to take that equity lens because of these statistics. We've seen the same thing in the vaccination, for example, in pregnancy. Currently for flu, um, only about a half of pregnant women actually get vaccinated for flu. Something that we know very clearly, we have evidence, it's plenty available most, most seasons, yet only half. We also know that there's a tremendous um, racial and ethnic uh, disparity in that too. So the point is that we're even not doing a good job of something that we should be doing routinely with uh, something sim simple as a flu vaccine. So um, a syndemic is basically a number of pandemics that are happening or epidemics that are happening together. What is happening that we often do not recognize is we have not just a, a global COVID pandemic, but we have other um, issues that are going on. So we're facing a suicide epidemic. We have significant amount of data coming in now to show that the, there are increases in opioid-related overdose deaths. There was, there was a record-breaking year in 2019. We expect 2020 to be no less. We also know that um, there are risks in, in increasing the, both the gender inequalities in other countries. I've talked to my colleagues in Kenya, for example, and, and, and they're telling us that they're actually having a lot more sex trade now as a result of lockdowns and economic instability that is happening. So it's giving rise to a lot more violence and a lot more, and that's going, their fear of that there is that we will see HIV outbreaks and STD outbreaks as a result of this. And then obviously domestic violence. So there are all of these things that are going on together and collectively that we must cannot know. And then finally, um, there's a study out there that shows that we may actually, we have a declining birth rate in this country, fertility over a number of years, and that may actually get worse. So it's my final slide. Um, the issue then becomes is what can we do and what needs, we need to be careful about when we think about a global public vaccination campaign. And I think there are some things that we need to consider factors as and they can be recommendations. The first one is safety. So we're having new vaccine platforms. Uh, we, we may have inadequate preclinical data. We've talked about that how we have at least a, a phase three clinical trials happening. Um, we have lack of detailed information on pre protective correlates of immunity because some of these, vac uh, some, uh, some of these vaccines may actually uh, not only interrupt the immune, immune system, but actually be hyper. So we should consider having um, a global vaccine address, very much a US VAERS kind of equivalent but making sure that we are getting those, those um, numbers in place so we can in real time adjust accordingly when the campaign is ongoing. Uh, it's very important to define effectiveness and co-administration for vaccines like flu. So which population benefits and how much? I love the conversation we were having because you look at a vaccine, um, Dr. Morita mentioned, there's, there's also vaccine characteristics, not just human characteristics. So is it going to be able to have an impact of herd immunity between 67 and 70 percent or is it going to be effective in most highest risk populations or is it both we look at flu vaccine each year that way because if it is just going to reduce the severity of illness those people are high risk people are elderly obese and others while they may not be able to mount such a great response so that becomes another factor so those are the kind of things that are important to think about um, special populations, uh, we still are not including pregnant and lactating women in clinical trials for vaccine and therapeutics. Uh, we are not um, taking, again, adequately uh, accounting for the racial and ethnic disparities that already exist in our communities. Um, you know, we, we have remdesivir and uh, obviously dexamethasone as treatments, as I'm giving you an example. Uh, it's being given out to pregnant women in those when it's appropriate to do so, yet they're not part of clinical trial. So it's very important to consider that population because 6 million women about in this country become pregnant and 4 million deliveries happen each year. Access is important because, uh, especially in poorer countries, we need to think about tiered pricing strategy, 
local vaccine development potentially, because um, there may be those issues of nationalism, not that we want to see that, but that's unfortunately where we're heading in so many ways. And finally, the supply and ethics and public trust. I know we've talked about this a lot, but our charge is not just to uh, vaccinate 300 million people, it's to vaccinate 7.7 .7 billion people at risk because no longer, the world is a flat place now. And, and, and developing that public trust in vaccination should precede the development of the vaccine. And, and that's probably the most important piece in terms of we've got to make sure that people are ready for the vaccine, the United States and across the globe. With that, I'll, um, I'll stop here and happy to participate. Okay, uh, thank you for all three speakers. Those are great presentations. Well, for the question uh, hand raises are coming in, then we're gonna start here with uh, Juliet. Hi, I'm Juliet Beverly from brainfacts.org in Washington, DC. Thank you for your presentations. Uh, my first question is for Dr. Uh, Gupta and just to uh, get your perspective on which vaccines and supply or in development are most at risk given the shift toward uh, COVID vaccine. Uh, development and two for doctors Marita and Benjamin, uh, you know, knowing that uh, communities of color are most affected by COVID-19, what sciences or data are really being tapped to make sure that messaging about getting on board with taking vaccine when it's ready um, will be most effective for these communities? Thank you, Juliet. Um, it's when we look at the vaccines, there are one way to go about is having the classic platform, which basically focus on the protein subunit or a virus like particle. Those examples would be the seasonal flu vaccine, the HPV vaccine, um, the MMR vaccine that has life tenoted. Um, those would be the ones that you would eventually, if you use, decide to choose that platform, then those will be interrupted potentially. Uh, because it's the, still the same, you think about a supply chain, it's the same platform. Now, if there are uh, new platforms developed, as is being done for a number of those, including the mRNA vaccine, then it will obviously, the challenges will be not just the vaccine supply volume, but also uh, potentially how do you give that in the terms of supplies that are adjacent to the vaccine that are needed, as Dr. Benjamin mentioned. Thank you. Sure, I could, uh, I can add that. I know that, um... The administration has given a grant to the Morehouse School of Medicine to lead a, a national campaign to engage um, communities of color, um, both for testing, treatment, and to um, think about how to, to engage in the vaccine. Um, there's a lot of science out there as, as to how to reach the communities of color, and it starts with making sure that they have spokespeople that look like them, um, people that have the experiences that they have. Um, you know, um, having um, um, African-American physicians, nurses, PAs, um, but also, as I mentioned, talking to faith leaders, talking to influencers, um, maybe getting, you know, people um, in the, the, the musical industry and those who have social media platforms um, to get the right messages out. Um, and it's gonna require a coordinated effort. It's gonna require a lot of effort um, because these communities come with enormous distrust to start with. Um, let, let me just say that I remember when Georgia opened up and said the first people we're going to have, um, we're going to let go back to work are barbers and beauticians. That got interpreted by a black community as you want us as guinea pigs to see if it's okay to go outside. Um, that, you know, the message should have been these are small offices and, and they have a lower risk. But that wasn't the message was delivered because it wasn't delivered in a culturally competent way. And so, you know, the debate right now is who should get the vaccine first? Um, and many people say, well, it should be communities of color because they're at high risk. And the communities of color are saying, no, 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 you want to give us that vaccine because you want to, you want to experiment on us. You want to see if it's safe. So there's a lot of really good risk communication that has to happen and explaining to why at-risk populations ought to get it first. And I would argue, you don't say we want all people of color to get it first because they're at higher risk. The way you say is we want all high risk people to get it first, which of course will, will get a, a large number of communities of color. But they have to think that through. Um, and, and I know there's a lot of debate and Julie pointed out there's ethicists thinking this through, et cetera. But 
they really also need to have the really good risk communicators in that room too, because at the end of the day, however they decide to prioritize, they got to sell this. I, I can add to that as well. Thanks, Georges. I think that was a great description of what the status is right now. I, I also feel like I, I feel like a broken record because I keep going back to the need to tap into the existing immunization infrastructure because the public health network that we have, which has state and local health departments scattered throughout the nation, many of the health departments recently have been focusing more on this equity piece. What that means is really engagement with community in terms of planning as well as implementation of public health initiatives. And so if you look at Chicago, there's a great example of work that was built on public health work. The city of Chicago developed a, rap, um, a racial equity rapid response, uh, which really involves using data, looking at data, who's most affected by COVID, who's in terms of death or disease or hospitalization, and then also engaging with the communities to actually help them develop the solutions and the problems. How do we reach out to the community? What messages are resonating? What are the barriers? How do, what, what, who are the messengers that should be conveying the information? Because I think there is some value in there being local effort because you know the communities and you can get the trusted voices within the communities to actually disseminate the messaging. So I, I believe, I'm a firm believer in tapping into the existing system because number one, there are systems that are already in place. There are also relationships that are in place and systems are, and networks that have been established in recent years to really address this racial equity, health equity, issues so that we can actually understand the problems and get the information that's necessary to the right people so they can then help spread the message as well because it is what the message is but it's also who the messenger is it's really critical okay so we'll go to umair right now and i just want to give everybody a heads up on time we have got about 10 people with their hands up right now so in general if you're able to kind of target your questions to one as opposed to a, a, to a whoever on the panel um, and hopefully then we can get through to everybody's questions. But Umer has the floor right now. Hey, Umer Arfan at Vox. Uh, for Dr. Gupta, you talked just at the end a little bit about the uh, new vaccine platforms, the mRNA and the adenovirus. Uh, just to clarify, do those platforms now have to face a higher uh, standard for safety because they're new? Or is it just going to be a larger gap between where they are now and the, and the, the safety threshold that they have to meet to be approved? And does that have any implications for the vaccine as it's being distributed? Yeah, so I think they have to meet the same standards that, that exist currently for safety. And of course, we want to make sure that um, the administration ensures the due diligence in ensuring and making sure that, that uh, everything is done in order. There's no corners cut, let's say. Uh, there's, there's the red tape exists for a purpose, for, for, for a lot of reasons. And, and that is important to do that. Now, for the new platforms, uh, I want to be positive about this, because if the new platforms work in a, in a way that it may actually change how other vaccines are produced. So we may be at the cusp of very much a new technology that we're gonna see for the first time in, in, a, in, in over a century, basically. So it's a positive thing, but we have to be very careful approaching it. I'm Taryn Mento, I'm a reporter in San Diego. Um, I wanted to know about distributing uh, vaccinations among border regions, especially U.S. Mexico. Um, and Dr. Gupta, this might be best directed to you, but but anyone can can jump in. I mean, what are we considering here when we're we're because I, I know the flu vaccine is more um, recommended for border regions. So I just kind of wanted to put that idea out there and see what you had to say. Yeah, that. thanks for that. Um, and so I think that's the problem, right? So we have camps right now. We have lots of people who have been um, re retained in detention centers, for example. And uh, these, these, you know, what could, should be considered as taking time bombs unless we make sure that the vaccines are coming there. That's, so that's one point I want to make for sure, that we often tend to ignore those populations that are there. But the second piece is we've seen this in Afghanistan and Pakistan border, which borders are very similar, which is every time a conflict breaks out, or people believe that they're being uh, immunized for a different purpose, or there are connections to government, uh, then, then people stop taking the vaccine. So I think it's gonna be very important, even on our borders, uh, especially the southern border, that we are able to coordinate very closely and well with the with Mexican government in order to have a seamless uh, approach. So that's where the nationalistic side of this versus um, if there are people coming in, we have to make sure that they're also covered. So it's going to be, it has to be a contiguous effort uh, across the regions, just like it is going to be for state and counties. It has to be that for our borders as well, north and south. Yeah, let me just add real quickly that, that, that the health officers along the border, they partner with the health officers across the border on all kinds of things all the time. 
particularly vaccine infection, you know, preventable diseases, STDs, HIV. So as long as we can keep the politicians out of it um, and custom and border out of it, um, it, it'll work. And I guess that's just kind of, it always seems like any other efforts are always coordinated between our city's mayor and Tijuana's mayor. Is it usually going, that collaboration usually going to happen at that very hyper-local level? We hope so. It has to be in order to be successful. Agree with that. Yeah. Okay, so um, Adriana. Hi, Adriana Rodriguez from USA Today. I was wondering, um, quick question, uh, Dr. Gupta, about um, distribution efforts. What's the history of distribution efforts to US territories, specifically to uh, Puerto Rico? You know, there's 5 million uh, Puerto Ricans in the US, 3 million in the island. We go back and forth. So uh, what does that, what has that looked like? And what, I guess, should it look like for the coronavirus? Yeah, so there is a, obviously a health uh, secretary's office there, very similar, and there are mechanisms and structures within that. One of our board members actually, Marsh Times, is actually an integral part of an OB, uh, OB Joanna of that system right now as we speak. So uh, it's very important because those are some of the also, when we talk about high-risk populations, that's where the high risk also comes in. So it's going to be very important that we do not discriminate within our territories and the contiguous uh, states. So that, that's, I think if that's a very important political point to just, just we have to be cognizant of that and, and mindful of that, that we're, we're, we're making sure that all the supply, the same standards and high risk, um, you know, if, if, if that needs to happen, is going uh, also to, the, to, to Puerto Rico as well as other territories. But has it, has it been that way in the past? I know we were talking about H1N1 before, um, Dr. Morita. I mean, are we good at that? <laughs> yeah, so I, the, the VFC program that I talked about, or the immunization infrastructure that I described, which is ongoing and constant for all the routinely recommended vaccines, the Puerto Rico is part of it. All the territories are a part of it. So they receive the vaccine in the same way that the states and large urban areas actually do. And so it is, that's another reason, yet another reason why that system should be tapped into. There is already an infrastructure in place which can be ramped up and it allows for coverage within the territories. Wake Gibbs, I'm a writer with Scientific American in Seattle. Uh, for Dr. Benjamin, um, what parts of the supply chain specifically are you most concerned uh, might be uh, a real bottleneck for getting this vaccine out to the population? Yeah, and, and understand that I love to be science-based and I'm not being science-based, but, but um, um, vials and, and stoppers. <laughs> um, and, and there's a reason for that. You know, um, there's, a, there's a global need for it. Um, and, um, you know, it, it's something crazy like that. Syringes are probably less of a problem. Um, but I think vials and stoppers, if I, you know, if I was, I was one to pay attention and what can go wrong, it, it'd be that. Claire Felter with the Council on Foreign Relations. My question's for Dr. Gupta. You brought up the, um, you know, challenge of uh, mistrust, um, particularly in communities in other countries, when a vaccine is being uh, manufactured and, and uh, distributed from abroad. Um, and I'm wondering if you could, um, you know, discuss maybe some strategies that, that you've seen as successful for kind of dealing with that mistrust and improving trust overall. Absolutely. So, for example, we're funding a number of companies like AstraZeneca, as an example. Um, AstraZeneca does have other places where manufacturing happens. So there's no reason that uh, with existing platform, but especially newer platforms, that we could not target those nations that have a larger segment of the population. And so the way it is, is it's unless there are political considerations specific for that, those countries, but generally it's global, it's regional, then it's very much where you are and what your, who your neighbors are. It's not very different from what we look at our communities. So it's gonna be important to have, if we can't have a nation, national producer, then we have regional producers that people feel confident in both the credibility and the validity. And again, it goes back to another way of cultural, cultural way of looking at it because if it's being for, for, uh, you know, produced in a place where people look like you and they can almost speak like you, then you're more likely to take that vaccine as well. So uh, there's going to be uh, important to make sure that um, that ability for some of these global production uh, companies is available and is paid attention to. It may cost a little more, but that would be critical. 
My name is Anna Sussman. I'm a freelance journalist. I write a lot about women's health. Um, this question is for Dr. Gupta. You mentioned that no one's testing now um, on pregnant or lactating women. I was wondering, do you, I've asked the companies about this too. I mean, do you think they should be included in phase three trials or would you recommend waiting later, waiting longer? There are multiple ways of doing it. If we consider that to be a priority and we consider that to be a priority, uh, we hope others do as well, which is you could do them as phase three, you could also do them phase four. Um, for example, right now, when I mentioned remdesivir, um, women are, pregnant women are being given remdesivir uh, as not as a part of clinical trial because um, that's not been thought of in that way at many hospitals. So it's important that uh, sometimes we are doing that. Now we need to have separate um, sort of uh, knowledge about what happens to pregnant women. Here's why, because if pregnant women are excluded, then we have to have a special campaign to ensure that women of reproductive age are able to get the vaccine, just like we do for MMR and other vac live vaccines. That, so what we cannot do is exclude pregnant women but also don't emphasize the women of reproductive age so they can get the vaccine prior to becoming pregnant. And because when we do that, uh, women of minorities especially suffer. Quick question, are the, are the women being given remdesivir being tracked, even if they're not part of a clinical trial? No. Well, at a local hospital to hospital level, they are, right. but not at a national or regional level. Okay. And that's the point. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I'm, my name is Leslie McClurg. I'm from NPR affiliate here in San Francisco in the Bay Area. I'm curious if someone could give some historical context to just say, where are we at in terms of health equity? Like, is this a moment where we're reflecting we've declined in recent years? Or are, are we better than ever because it's been so bad in the past? I'm just trying to get a sense of, of how health equity is playing out in this moment compared to the past. So I can jump in and then maybe others can fill in. Um, I think we, we have, the foundation has focused on uh, health equity as a, a critical need. And I think what this pandemic has done is really underscore the fact that we have underlying health disparities that have not been addressed uh, over time. And that a lot of the reasons these things haven't been addressed is because there's systems and structures in place that have prevented us from addressing them. So it goes into the root causes of underlying poor health. So things like housing, um, community conditions. Um, redlining in the past has contributed to segregation in the city of Chicago that is really unbelievable. And as a result, these communities don't have the resources or the supports they need to have healthy lives. And so people's baseline health conditions are really not good. And so when something like the pandemic or COVID comes along, who gets most seriously affected? These folks have poor health at baseline. These people, the uh, people of color have, and people living in low income communities, don't have the ability to adhere to the public health interventions that are recommended. How many can work at home? How many can do the social distancing that's required? And so it's, it's not, I'd say that there has been progress made in terms of addressing some disparities. You look at immunization coverage levels in children and health, racial and ethnic disparities have really, are basically have been eliminated. And yet there's still these ongoing persistent problems with health disparities that have not been addressed. And the COVID just really, lifted it up and highlighted it and said, this is still a problem. And it's, we see this time and time again, when that, whether it's a measles outbreak, whether it's a heat wave in Chicago, or whether it's COVID, these public health emergencies really just uh, underscore the baseline inequities that exist. So there's, what I'm, what I'm really gives me hope is that people are talking about health equity, talking about race equity in ways that we have not talked about it in the past. And there's a moment with the murder of George Floyd where there is, there are a lot of calls for action and for everyone in the nation to really start taking this seriously and doing some work to break down these systems and rebuild systems that are better and will advance health equity. So uh, I think there's a lot of work to be done and I'm hopeful that we'll actually make some progress and that COVID will help make the case for why we need to do so. Yeah. And, and I would add that morbidity and mortality has come down for all races. What hasn't happened is the gap hasn't been reduced. Um, now, there, uh, except where there's been targeted efforts, and there's been targeted efforts to get screening done. So there are many places where we have screening that's equal. In fact, for some minorities, it might even be better for some areas. Um, infant mortality, a little better, but not much. Um, but the point is that we've targeted a few areas, and they've come down, but we've not addressed anything in a real systematic way. Um, health insurance coverage, you know, the fact that we have so many states 
that had high African American populations that didn't take the Medicaid program expansion. And we see huge disparities between those states that expand the Medicaid and, and not for all populations, but in particular for communities of color. So we've not done the systematic things that Julie pointed out um, that are the fundamental things that are racially based that result in health inequities. And until we do that, we're going to, they're still going to persist. And I just want to make a point that it was 2003 when the former Institute of Medicine came out and said un, uh, the report called Unequal Treatments, Identified Racism and Issue in Health. We, in 2009, did the, you know, we found out that there's 45,000 Americans that are dying because of lack of health insurance. We still do not have any um, documentation of uh, objective criteria of figuring out. So we have not made this also a, a priority of assessing the actual uh, objective assessment of, of, of the health inequities in terms of life loss. That's one. Same piece is, it makes common sense. For example, if, if a, a black woman are three to four times more likely to die in childbirth than white women, well, guess where you're going to get most of your gains? Well, uh, eliminating the disparity. So in a lot of places, in a lot of areas, eliminating disparity makes not only moral and ethical sense, but it also makes financial economic sense to do so as well. So it, it just is the right thing, but it's also the economically viable and, and sustainable thing for, to do for our country. Hi, this is uh, Jillian Mooney from Healthline News and the Freaking Editor out here. Um, I just had a question about, um, you mentioned instances in the past where vaccines ended up causing problems, the swine flu in the 70s and the um, polio vaccine. What did health officials learn in terms of interacting with the public after complications occur? Um, and what can we learn from those instances now? I mean, we had um, the, the measles cases last year from, from people not vaccinating. Um, when this, I think all three of you mentioned that a complication is likely to occur at some point. Um, how can both public health officials kind of acknowledge that and talk about risk? How can reporters do the, the same thing? Thank you. I can start and then maybe others can jump in as well. I think a good example, uh, so a lot has been learned because of um, adverse events that have occurred post-vaccination. Uh, because of experiences we've had in the past, there is, Dr. Gupta mentioned the ad vaccine adverse event reporting system. There are several systems in place to monitor adverse events that occur after vaccinate vaccines are actually licensed and recommended. Because, you know, we, uh, there's a lot of discussion about the phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials. And these are done in um, increasing population, size population. So ultimately, the phase three trials will have thousands of people that are enrolled. But when a vaccine is actually administered in a scale of millions, which this vaccine and all routinely recommended vaccines are, there will be adverse events. There may be adverse events that occur that couldn't have been picked up because a thousand people who get vaccinated will not be able, they won't, you just won't see that. And so as a result of that, there's been effort made to really communicate that potential to the public. The number one, that there are really great criteria, strict science that's used to evaluate the safety and efficacy of vaccines before a vaccine is licensed. But we recognize that sometimes when it is administered to millions of people, like the rotavirus vaccine, there will be rare events that occur that weren't anticipated. And then that vaccine was pulled off the market. And so there are these systems that are in place now to actually detect these ad rare adverse events that hadn't been able to be detected in the prior study. So it is a matter of transparency, which I think is the critical thing when we want to get people's trust whether you're black, brown, or white, in order to have trust in a vaccine, we have to understand what are the steps that are really involved in assuring that they're safe and effective? What are the systems in place to monitor for them as they're rolled out on a larger scale? And do we have confidence in the system to actually pull back a vaccine and say, wait, it didn't work, or we have this concern and we need to take it off. So, and flu mist actually vaccine, the nasal flu vaccine is another one that's fairly recent, but because of the systems that are in place, we were able to look at the efficacy, we were able to look at the side effects and then respond appropriately when these things have occurred. And I also think it, it, it is the messenger has to be trusted before you carry the message. So this work of trust has to be built up from top down. Uh, and we, we're talking about the presidential level back down to the scientists and CDC and everybody else. No am amount of information and message, how clear and how important it is will be relayed as, as long as the public doesn't trust the messenger. So it's very important not to provide confusing signals and be very clear and be evidence 
driven and science based. Okay, so I don't have anything to add. No, uh, okay, uh, Doctor, or uh, I'm sorry, uh, Lisa. Yes, uh, thank you. So this is specific for, for Dr. Gupta, and this gets to the access global allocation issue. And it's a stupid question, but if one nation designs and produces, manufactures a vaccine, what access do other nations have to it? So there's, a, there's something called the most favored nation clause, right? So, so what happens is uh, WHO did not actually adopt the polio elimination campaign until 1988 when they launched it. And we were polio free back in the 70s. So we did this where we actually provided a, a disproportionate amount of benefit to Americans, uh, I would say, and then we went and cured the world. Um, it's a very different world today. And, and today, um, other nations are gonna be vying for, they have potentially the technology to develop vaccines equal or better than what we may be developing here. So the question not only becomes what other nations, but um, they're watching our behavior. So if there's, a, is a, if there's a strong, robust, good vaccine that comes out of Germany or China or India, what's gonna happen is they'll say, well, we're gonna hoard it as well. So, or we're gonna sell you at a very expensive price. So I think it's, it's almost as a world leaders, we have to um, act as leaders and we have to figure out how do we get a global population vaccinated and immunized at the lowest cost possible. But the most favored nation clause is one that allows uh, nations to be able to negotiate prices um, with companies at different. So you could have a Lipitor for $10 a pill here, and yeah, it'll be a penny a pill, but it does becomes, it, these are, those are negotiations that happen in prices. Yeah. Dr. Benjamin, I you, I'm guessing you had thoughts on that also. Yeah, yeah. You know, the the the, the challenge we have, of course, is the, um, there, there's a, a lot, a big national effort to make sure that that uh, the U.S. doesn't hog all the vaccine. Um, and and but you know, there is a um, the head of the National Academy of Medicine, Victor Zhao, um, the head of the World Bank, um, folks at WHO. They they've raised ten twenty billion dollars in pledges to ensure that there is a vaccine for everybody. Um, and interestingly enough, the U.S. is not a participant of that piece, but we are a participant through the science side of things, working to make sure that this vaccine um, um, is available to everyone. So I anticipate that there will be clearly national hoarding and some disputes about sharing, because there always is. But I, but I do think, again, the science community is working really hard to mitigate that as best they can. Thank you. Okay. And final question to Kira. Hi, Kira from Leapsmag. I'm wondering what you think the possibility is of a COVID vaccine eventually being made mandatory for specific populations like healthcare workers or eventually school attendants. I, I think that that's... Um, Interesting question, um, and I'm not sure that that's going to. No, I don't. I don't think. I don't think that that will be happen early in the, in the outbreak. Um, but I think at some point we're going to have to have that debate. I, you know, I think the big issue is whether or not, if it turns out this is seasonal, um, then um, that will certainly come up. If it turns out it's a one-off, meaning you have to get two shots, and um, and then. You know, the disease doesn't come back, you know, it's not a seasonal disease. I think that's less likely to be a, dis a point of discussion because at some point we'll have herd immunity and then it won't be an issue anymore. And let's remember the legal authority lies in the local and state levels to do any of that. Just want to make sure. I think that's right. I think the school vaccine requirements for children have been highly, highly effective, as have flu vaccine requirements for uh, healthcare workers. Um, but they, the, a long time, uh, there was a lot of effort done to get people vaccinated through voluntary measures first. And so I think it would, I, I don't, I would not anticipate there being a mandatory uh, requirements for vaccination for this vaccine, for sure, this, for this round, for sure. Um, and if I could ask just one question, uh, Dr. Gupta, you touched on this a, uh, a bit, but the notion of all the vaccinations that should be happening this year that aren't happening. Um, two questions, and I guess e any of the three of you can address that. Should those, I mean, should parents still be taking their kids in um, 
for those vaccinations right now? Are there alternative, alternative ways they can get those? And even in assuming that most of these or many of these won't be done this year, what kind of, you know, what kind of damage will we see in this in the out years? So I'll go for that. I mean, there are definitely accelerated vaccine schedules that exist for other vaccines that can happen. But I think we're playing with fire when we talk about um, not taking our kids uh, uh, to get the vaccine that are already recommended and very well vetted um, by ACIP um, for, for childhood vaccination. So I, I do think that we have to have a concerted effort um, moving forward to ensure that those rates do not fall because the outbreak of those diseases will not only complicate our efforts, but actually be very expensive. Um, so that, that's important um, from, from that perspective. Yeah, yeah, look, look, we're all worried about kids going back to school. They don't go back to school if they don't have their shots. <laughs> and I can guarantee you that because we will have a measles outbreak and measles is a whole lot more infectious than COVID. Um, so I, 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 um, um, the answer is, yeah, there's no reason why kids can't go get their shots, go to their doctor. We got to get those pediatric, pediatric off, pediatrician's offices open so the kids can get in there and get their shots. What I've been impressed with is with the healthcare that I've received during the pandemic is that the healthcare facilities that are open are actually using really good infection control practices and trying to assure that those who are coming in are actually able to get the health services they need without being exposed unnecessarily. And so, and the vaccines are critical. The key, a key thing to keep in mind too is that people who have missed back doses, kids that are told, children or adults who have missed vaccine doses, don't have to start over again. It's not a problem having your vaccine spread out over time. You don't want to do that if it's not necessary, but if people have had prolonged periods of time between doses, they don't have to restart. And so no harm will have been done, but they do need to go in and get their vaccine. 